Hello, welcome to another edition of the Pace Report. I'm Brian Pace reporting live here at SOBs here in New York City. Cody Chestnut last year had a dynamic and stellar year releasing his second project called Landing on 100. And what I really like about this project is one, he did some things very outside of the box as far as raising money to make this project as well as him going to the legendary Royal Studios in Memphis, Tennessee, that great place where Willie Mitchell and Al Green laid their magic on soul music in the 1970s. We sat back earlier and we talked about this project, we talked about where he is musically, and we also talked about some of his musical influences, which you'll find very dynamic on how it really shaped and enriched Cody's music style. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the sounds of Mr. Cody Chestnut, live here at SOB's here in New York City. four years has done since the last time we broke bread. Um, the last time we talked, the music that you presented was the new music, which is on your current album, Landing on 100. Right, absolutely. That was kind of the, uh, the, the genesis of it all. I wanted to bring it out immediately to the people and, and see how it connected and see how it resonated with people. And uh, people really loved it, so I felt like it was time to document it. How do you feel now you know, with the, the, the hiatus that you took off musically, just to get everything together on the personal and music tip. But also, how do you feel now that this music is out? I feel amazing, man. Um, I feel like I've had a chance to uh, bring the journey full circle. You know, it was about going away, getting some more life experience, getting some more information uh, and, and personal growth. And now it feels like I get a chance to actually uh, complete that that part of the the journey, you know, getting that information, then bringing it back around and, and sharing it uh, in in the most sincere way that I can, and so uh, it, it feels amazing. You know, you did a couple of things on this project. One, you went a very different route in raising money. You did the Kickstarter project. How did that come about? Um, my manager actually um, recommended. She suggested it. I, I heard about Kickstarter about maybe eight months before. Uh, a friend of mine was trying to raise money to fund uh, a Lebanese uh, food truck, you know, the kind of trucks you drive around and sell food after, you know, shows or whatever on the street. Uh, so I thought it was a cool idea. She was going for eight grand, and she actually raised the money. 
And uh, I thought it was an amazing concept, but I kind of put it on the back burner. And then when the funds began to run low for our project, then she was like, what about a Kickstarter? And uh, I was like, cool, because at this point in time, I was really open, you know, to all the different uh, ways of, of distributing music or making a project, you know, a reality. So I was open to it. You went back to some of my old stomping grounds. I went to school in Memphis, Tennessee. Okay. You recorded this project at the famous Royal Studios, the the, the home of Willie Mitchell and Al Green. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, unfortunately, Willie Mitchell is no longer with us, but his son, Boo Mitchell, is running the place, and, uh, and he has his father's spirit. And uh, it was an amazing, um, amazing experience. Um, it started out initially, we were trying to find the, the studio uh, that had uh, the best rates for analog recording. Uh, so we were looking at Miami, New York, um, Atlanta, and turns out Memphis had the cheapest rates. But, but once we got there, we realized that it was the perfect place for what we were trying to do musically and spiritually. Because um, everybody walked into the place, man, and, and literally just got goosebumps and, and, and just got really um, connected to what had been there before and wanted to bring that same kind of energy and commitment to this project. Um, but one thing I, I normally leave out uh, in, in interviews, uh, we also went to the Lorraine Motel. Before, yeah, right, before we recorded, and everybody seemed to um, become a bit more centered, you know, and became uh, very focused and, and, and uh, how shall I put it, yeah, that, that's, that's the best way to describe it. Just really focus on what this music was about and what it should be and what the commitment should be and what, what the purpose of the music was. So, uh, yeah, all in all, it was, an, it was an amazing trip in Memphis. Isn't it strange when you go to the Lorraine Motel, you look at the point where King was assassinated, it humbles you. It, you it, it's, it's a very, very, you, you're just quiet for like 20 minutes. That's exactly what it was. Everybody in the whole scene, we pulled in about maybe seven that morning before they even opened. Uh, and I'd been there uh, the week uh, prior to us coming to record the record. I, can't, I went with my family specifically for that experience. And I said, well, when we come back with the band, I got to bring them here because I, I didn't know who had been, but it didn't matter. Everybody needed to experience that. And um, so when I pulled up, on the side of the hotel, instantly everybody got quiet, you know, and I think we were quiet for the next 25 or 30 minutes, you know, just taking it in because you, you'd, you'd seen all the, the, the history books and the documentaries, but now you're standing right on the ground, you know what I mean, and uh, you, you truly become overwhelmed. You know, Royal Studios is almost the same thing, you know, you look at this, and, and it's crazy because you think of all the musicians that came out of there, you had uh, Syl Johnson, Ovi Wright recorded there, and you have a, a very old soul when it comes to bringing the music back. What was it like channeling the spirits of Willie Mitchell and that great plethora of artists that came out of there? It just felt like home. It, it felt like that's exactly where we needed to be. As I said earlier, we didn't choose it at first, but once we walked into the live room where all the recording take, took place, it just felt right, like this is exactly where we needed to be. And uh, everybody fed off the history of it. So um, as with the L Lorraine Motel, you, you, be you become very humble uh, and you just want to absorb, you know, what's been left there, you know, and hopefully you can transmit that to your own performance. And I think that's really what we tried to accomplish. But um, it, was, it, was, it was an honor, man. Uh, Boo was so, he shared so much love, man, with the whole, uh, facility, you know, he brought out the the old microphone that that Al Green used to record his pieces on. You know, uh, uh, love and happiness, let's stay together. And I got a chance to use those mic, that mic, uh, mic number nine, uh, to use as a guy vocal as we were tracking with the band. You know, so all of that it felt it felt ex extremely special, man. One, two, three, go. <laughs>
Landing on 100, you know, you've, for your second project, the songs on here are really out of this world. I mean, one, you know, I, I, I think one of the best songs on here is two of them. I like Chips Down. And the one everyone is talking about is Everybody's Brother. But again, you stepped outside of the box and you wrote about a condition and a condition that everyone has probably experienced with themselves or with a family yeah, member. That's why, yeah, that's why I named it Everybody's Brother because everybody knows one of those cats, you know, one of the guys that had an addiction problem or a gambling problem or, you know, that walked out on the family or they just couldn't get it right, but at the same time, you know, made it out of, you know, the destruction, you know, because that's really what I wanted to focus on the song, um, focus on in the song. I wanted to, you know, put people in front of the eight ball instead of just, you know, constantly standing behind it, you know. So um, that's why the refrain is no turning back because, you know, the person finally made it through all of that destructive behavior, you know, breaking down the family, you know, uh, you know reducing their own humanity, you know, to, to zero. But they finally, you know, found the purpose again, and they're, they're you know, determined not to go back, you know, to their old habits. So, uh, yeah, I just figured everybody could relate to one of those characters one way or another. Yeah. <laughs> Another person who, in our generation, was pretty much our Elvis. Another person you you hailed as one of your major influences was Michael Jackson. Mm. Tell me about what Michael meant to you, and reflect on what he did for you as far as where you are now musically and what he's done for the world. Because a lot of people miss him. Oh man, Michael Jackson. Sometimes that's really all I can say. Just those two words. You know, Michael Jackson. It, as most kids, you know, he, he was the light, you know, in, in, in the art form. Um, I really, aside from, you know, the early Jackson 5 stuff with Motown, which was, you know, very, um, what's the what's the word? Polished. No, 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 it was polished too, but it was something else I'm trying to describe. Um, contagious. The energy of it was very contagious, you know, and, and you just fell right into it, but when he matured uh, into the Michael Jackson of, of Off the Wall, 
that's when the light really turned on for me, you know, when, when you know, and I've said this in, in many interviews, you know, when I saw the album cover, you know, it was like really looking at a superhero with, with the glowing socks and the smile, you know, and it, it all just it leaped off, you know, the, the cover, and um, it was the first album that I really spent time with, you know, looking at the, the liner notes and, and really trying to absorb the whole thing, you know. Um, so, yeah, for, for me, Michael Jackson, you know, artistically was the light in my life that pointed the direction in terms of the, the, the commitment to the communication of it all, you know, lyrically, body language, everything, you know, the, the rhythm of it all, um, the joy uh, that's possible, you know, with the art form. Um, I, I could go on and on, but he is, man, he is so missed, man, so missed. And, and I think, you know, people are realizing now when they look back that, you know, we have we've had the opportunity to experience something that you, you only see maybe once every hundred years or something. You know, that you know, you hear people say all the time there'll never be another this or that. There'll never be another Michael Jackson. You're right. Him and, and Whitney Houston. We will yeah, yeah, never yeah. we'll never see those guys. Again. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> you know, another thing that I want you to talk about and elaborate too, and I, I'm with you on this hundred percent. Tony, Tony, Tone were, in my opinion, one of the most underrated soul bands mm -hmm. of the late 80s and the 90s. And there's one of your, those guys are some of your musical influences also. Oh, for sure. Um, you know, they kept that real authentic band vibe alive, you know what I mean? Um, when everybody else was going to programming, they still championed, you know, playing your instruments. Uh, as we see now, you know, Rafael Sadiq is, you know, one of the most respected musicians, you know, across the board, all over the world. So, um, yeah, I, I remember just, you know, and I didn't think too much about it at the time, but I just remember, you know, how prolific they were. You know, they always came up with these great pop tunes. And so uh, they were inspiring in that regard, you know, that, okay, you can still have a, a, a soulful approach, you know, but write these, you know, incredibly uh, accessible songs, you know, that, that have mass appeal. Yeah. yeah, that last album they did, that Thinking of You took you really back to the Al Green. Mm -hmm. Took you back to the... And they were very, very soulful and authentic what they were doing. Yeah, yeah. I mean, once again, I mean, they they came through that school, though. They came through that school of learning, you know, playing outside on the sidewalks, church, you know, the whole nine. So they, they know the history of it, and that was always present you know, in, in, in their compositions and their writing style. Your album landing on a hundred. Was this the album coming out your debut record, which was remarkable? Is this the record that you always wanted to record? Mm, not. It's the record that I wanted to record after I realized that there was room to mature. You know, Headphone Masterpiece was the record that I wanted to record at the time. It's the record that I always wanted to record because I had been battling with so many. Uh, industry cats, you know, about being, you know, in a box, you know, being pigeon held, you know, like, okay, you have to be like this. And so Head for a Masterpiece was me being completely emancipated from that. You know, I was like, this is what I do, this is, these are the songs, this is how I think musically, this is what I, this is, this is it, you know, without any kind of uh, constraints, you know, so um, at that point in time, it was the record that I wanted to make, you know, just making the music that I genuinely felt. Uh, Landing on 100 is the record that uh, I wanted to make at that point in time because I I've always wanted to grow and evolve as an artist. So this album, you know, genuinely reflects, you know, uh, the growth period that I've had, you know, uh, and it's uncompromised uh, because I had the opportunity once again to, to just sit with my songs and not have to worry about somebody you know, uh, being a filter and saying, well, you know, you shouldn't record this or people are not in interested in that, you know. I, I really had a chance to just, you know, to, to speak my heart again. But speak it as a man in his 40s, as opposed to his late 20s and early 30s. That'll do it again for another edition of the Pace Report. I'm Brian Pace reporting live here at SOB's here in New York City. I'd like to personally thank the talented Cody Chestnut for his time, as well as the staff and management here at SOB's. As always, please visit my website, www.thepacereport.com, for my weekly column as well as my past segments. Until next time, remember, if it's in the groove, it'll make you move. Till next time, 
Peace. Ooh, ooh, ooh.